thing about Thanksgiving, though, is it helps us to, or it reminds us to be thankful. Because we ought to be a thankful people. <clears throat> and today, uh, I want to look at some, uh, some, someone who was very thankful. Now, we ought to be thankful for our health and for things that money cannot buy. That's really what we should focus on during not only this week, but every day of our life. Because uh, there's, it's nice to have things money can buy, but it's better to have things money can't buy. And so we ought to be. Uh, if you're not suffering, you ought to be thankful. Uh, today, we look at some men who were suffering. Uh, because of modern medicine, the world, most of us, and most of the world, doesn't know very much about a disease called leprosy. Right now, there's only 208,000 people, roughly, in the world who have leprosy. It's only about 100 people a year uh, in America who are diagnosed with it. And so it's a disease that, for the most part, has been vanished from the earth. And most of us have never seen a leper. We've read about it in the Bible. Maybe you've looked at it a little bit more, uh, read more about it. But if we've lived in the Bible times, we certainly would know all about leprosy. In the Bible times, it was the most feared disease that you could imagine. Uh, once you got it, it was incurable. You were completely hopeless. There was no uh, hope for a cure from it. So much did they fear it that anyone who was suspected of having this disease was completely banished from society. They had to be or they might give it to somebody else. In the Bible, there was no remedy. The rabbis referred to lepers as the living dead. In the Old Testament, uh, on, on top of all this, it was regarded as divine punishment. So imagine that. Not only did you lose your health, your family, your life, your place in society, now you had to bear the burden of everybody thinking you deserved it. Obviously, you did something for this to happen to you. What a terrible, terrible disease to have. It was a hideous disease. Today, it, we call it Hansen's disease, and it follows this pattern. Uh, first, a patch of discolored skin was, was uh, of course, today we would have more, a little bit more uh, uh, defined procedures, I'm sure, but in those days, they would see a patch of skin that was discolored, and it might occur your nose, ear, cheek, arm, wherever. Uh, the patch would turn white or pink, and it would begin to spread into every direction. Uh, the disease took on, uh, it would then spread to various internal organs. The tissues would begin to disintegrate, causing the hands and feet to become deformed, and eventually uh, the extremities would just actually fall off of your body. Nodules would grow on your vocal cords, and so that your voice would be very raspy, and you would not have the ability to speak as you would have beforehand. The body was in a state of decomposition. Uh, when I was uh, 14, I got, I fell off a horse. Does it sound better to say you were bucked off a horse or fell off a horse? But, uh, the horse fell, it was me on top of him, and I threw myself clear. It was on a gravel road, and I slid forward, and, and you can still see, I tell kids I have a rock in there still, so uh, it's just, a, I think it's just hard to start a skin. But since we were out of the Amish, we go to hospitals. Hospitals is for sissies. And so we just let this thing, uh, we, my mom put some stuff on it, and it was, uh, it was pretty bad. I should have had stitches. That's why I have this bad scar still today. But uh, when for, for weeks, I would try to put, I soaked it in Epsom salt. Um, I, I uh, kept stuff on it that, you know, Amish cures and all this stuff. We had trying to help this get better. But the problem was infection was in here. And uh, one of the things that was so offensive was the smell. I don't know if you've ever smelled that or if you've ever had a smell on your, but when I would take the bandage off, it smelled, I hate to be disgusting, but like rotting flesh because that's exactly what was going on here. And that was just a little spot. Um, and so then what did you do then? Rush to the hospital? No. We had spearmint oil that we dropped on it to try to kill the smell a little bit. Eventually, somebody talked, uh, talked us into going to the doctors and then I got, I mean, after weeks and weeks and weeks, they gave me some antibiotics and gave it a little shot, and it was gone, healed up in just a few days uh, because it was handled. But here's what leprosy would do. The, uh, the, 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 your, your body's decomposing. You would be, have a hideous, horrible smell about you as you are literally decomposing while you're alive. 
Leprosy attacked the nervous system. It compromised the body's ability to feel pain. You might step on a stone or a thorn and you wouldn't even know that anything happened because you wouldn't feel it and therefore uh, infection could set and eventually the limb would just fall off. You might, uh, it, it usually ran its course in about nine years and the, you would after that time suffer a horrible death. One of the worst aspects of leprosy though was the social isolation, the banishment from society. After a time when you were, uh, when you got leprosy, you had to go outside of the uh, community and you couldn't be around the folks you would love. Your family would have a funeral for you, even though you were not dead yet, but you were just as good as dead. And to give them some closure, knowing you'd never come back, they have a funeral service for you. You could probably pull a Tom Sawyer and watch it from afar if you wanted to, uh, as a as they basically put you in the ground. Leviticus 13 and 14 talks about special instructions uh, about the diagnosis and treatment of leprosy. It says that any rash or skin infection would be, you'd have to immediately go to the priest to be inspected. You would then be quarantined for seven days. And at the end of seven days, if the infection had disappeared, you could go home to be with your family. But if it hadn't and it was getting worse, then you would be diagnosed as a leper. Leviticus 13.45 tells us what happens next. And the leper to whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare. And he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone without the camp shall his habitation be. This was not unjustified cruelty. This had to happen or he could infect more. Society had to take care of itself as a whole. The leper would wear tattered clothes. His hair would be unkempt. The lower part of his face was covered. Yes, yes, there was a mask mandate for the leper back in the Old Testament. It was unlawful for a leper to be within 50 feet of somebody else. If it was windy, it would be 200 feet that he could not get it within another person. In South Dakota, it would be half a mile. You understand what that means. But uh, he had to, whenever somebody got close, he would have to scream out, unclean, unclean, because to, de to tell others of his condition. I was reading this this week and thinking, can you imagine if this morning every one of us had to shout out our sin as we walked around? Imagine if everything that was inside you and the worst of everything would be suddenly made manifest and we had to proclaim it. Well, then we would have no choice. Every one of us would have to say the same. Unclean, because we are, after all, unclean. The leper was defiled. He was distanced. He was doomed. Uh, and so are we until we meet Christ. With all this background, let's look at the passage in Luke chapter 17, starting verse number 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten lep men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And, he, and it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered, Were there not nine or ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. He said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Today I want to preach very simply on this subject. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I pray you'd help us. Bless the reading of the word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As Jesus is traveling near the border of Samaria and Galilee, he met a group of lepers. And uh, the Bible says that he's on his way to Jerusalem. We know that He's on his way to Jerusalem for the last time. He'd never go there again because death was on his mind. He is heading for what would be the worst thing that a human had ever experienced or would ever experience, the cross of Calvary. Yet Jesus did not allow his inner suffering to blind him to the needs of others. Can I repeat that? Jesus didn't allow his inner suffering to blind him to the needs of others. It was a remote area precisely where you might expect to find a leper colony. 
They were between Jerusalem or, or, uh, and, and, or Galilee and Samaria. It would be a remote place. Uh, Galilee was Jesus' home base. He was raised there. His headquarters was in Capernaum. But Samaria was another matter. The Jews hated the Samaritans. It goes all the way back to uh, 722 B.C., the Assyrian captivity, because some of the Jews and the Assyrians intermarried. And now the rest of the pure Jews would look at them as half-breeds and and uh, less than human even, called them dogs that have nothing to do with them. And the Samaritans hated the Jews, and the Jews hated the Samaritans. But in that, uh, it, is, it is here between Galilee and Samaria, Jesus meets ten lepers, and there we find a profound miracle. By the way, where else could Jesus? Uh, where else could they go? The Jews didn't want them. The Samaritans didn't want them. Uh, there's nobody would have anything to do with them, and so. But and it also is interesting to me that in their horrible condition, it no longer mattered, Jews and Samaritans, did it? You had a Samaritan in with Jews. Do you think they cared? No, they were. They had. They realized their condition, and it didn't matter anymore. Nobody could say, "I'm better than you." They were all ten of them were lepers, and so he had them together there. And uh, but look at verse twelve. And 13, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, there's a wonderful truth here I don't want you to miss. Luke refers to these men as men, or I should say these lepers as men. And when he does so, he acknowledges their humanity. He reclaims them from the dehumanization of their condition because the world saw them as lepers Jesus saw them as men I like that that's important because there's a truth in there you today are not what you are going through you may have cancer but that's not who you are you may have an addiction but that's not who you are you may struggle with pornography but that's not who you are what you are if you're a child of God is a child of God saved by his blood. What you have is an affliction from the devil, but God can rescue you from that, as we'll see today. People see you for what you're going through. God sees you for where you can be. That's why people saw a Simon, but Jesus saw a Peter. People saw a Saul of Tarsus, but Jesus saw a Paul, the apostle. I thank God that we're not defined by our adversities. Amen? Uh, we are defined by our Father. Now, so here's a colony of lepers joined by their common misfortune and misery. The only uniting characteristic is the foul disease that had cast them out of society. As Jesus enters the village, ten men uh, are afar off because they have to be. They have no choice. And they're crying out to him for mercy. Now, it's interesting where did they hear about Jesus? I mean, they're banished from society. They're not watching CNN. Or actually, then it was GNN, Galilean News Network. Uh, they're not watching television. They don't have cable. They're banished from society. Nobody's talking to them. But somehow they heard about Jesus. Maybe they heard it from Bartimaeus, the blind man that Jesus had healed. Maybe it was from uh, maybe they heard news about the fact that Jesus healed that woman that was lame and, and the, or that woman that was hunched over for so many years or the man that was lame or the guy that had a withered hand and all these miracles. That, because after all, among the sick, uh, stories of healing would be uh, told over and over again. And maybe they got to talking about, I wonder if he could heal us if we ever had a chance to meet him. They... I don't know where they heard it, but what they heard, they mixed with what they believed, and it gave them faith to act when we see it here in a minute. No doubt they heard the rumors floating across the countryside, and, and of course, when would we ever get a chance to meet him? There's no way we'll ever actually have him run across our path, and then one day, here they are, and they hear somehow that Jesus is here. Or he's close by. He's, maybe somebody came to clear the way like a sort of a front runner like they do for the president when you have a secret service come through. And, hey, we need all of you guys out of here because Jesus is coming by. And these ten men got together. You think he could heal us? I don't know. What do we have to lose? Let's cry out to him. 
There they stand, the most ragged choir in all of Israel. Ten lepers crying out to Jesus for mercy. Probably no more pitiful sound ever reached the ears of our Savior. Have mercy! For, uh, there was the cry that came from lips that had seen so little mercy and so much condemnation. Praise God for mercy. 26 times in Psalm 136, we find the words, For His mercy endureth forever. Uh, one of the most descriptive statements of God in all the Bible is that little statement right there. For his mercy endureth forever. Uh, the thought of the mercy of God is an incredible thing for us to contemplate. The fact that the God, God's mercy endureth forever means nothing can stop his mercy. This morning, are you plagued with your sin? Are you oppressed by your circumstances? His mercy goes deeper than your situation. No matter how deep you have fallen, His mercy is sufficient. It doesn't matter how far you have strayed, His mercy endureth forever. You cannot go outside His mercy. The Bible even says you could go to the depths of the sea and His mercy is there. Why? Because His mercy endureth forever. God's mercy goes beyond your deepest sin. Thank God for that because his mercy endureth forever. You'll recall the two men that went to the temple to pray. One of them was a proud as a peacock Pharisee, and he stood there, and, and he squared his shoulders back, and the other was a publican that stood a little bit down the way, and uh, the Pharisees praying to God, Dear God, thank you so much that I'm not like that guy. You ever heard somebody pray like that before? That, that, that's a real, aren't you just thankful for the spirituality of this Pharisee? Oh, thank you for making me so awesome. That was his basic prayer. And uh, thank you for making me not like him. Meanwhile, down here, this publican that was sitting here, and he was so distraught with his sin, and he realized his wickedness, and he couldn't even lift his eyes to look up because he was so ashamed. And he just beat on his chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He got mercy. He did not. Why? Because his mercy endureth forever. Doesn't matter how bad we are. Doesn't matter what we've done. His mercy endureth forever. And so these lepers cried out for mercy. What did, what would Jesus do? Now, one of the things that really amazes me about the miracles in the New Testament is just the variety. Have you ever noticed that? He does it. Sometimes a, a blind man will come and he'll say the word and he can see. Other times he'll spit in his eye. How would you like that? I would like to see, Lord. What is that? You know, uh, and he spit in his eye and he put mud and dirt in his eye, and he just did things differently, did, did different miracles different ways. So what would he do here? It was certainly within his power to say, all right, done, you're clean. But he didn't do that here. What he told them was to go show yourselves to the priest. Now, this is an inch, <laughs> I, I, th I would think of them hearing this, what is this? We've already shown ourselves to the priest, that's why we're here. This, see, this is, a, this is really quite a ridiculous thing for him to tell them to do. Because you don't show yourself to the priest when you already know you have leprosy. You show yourself to the priest either when you're clean or you think you might or to verify you don't have leprosy, but I can look at the lack of my fingers in my hands and I know I'm still sick. Go show yourselves to the priest. Notice Jesus did not touch them. He did not even promise them healing. Showing yourself to the priest was something you did after you were cleansed. But Jesus commands men to act, and I'm going to teach you a word today that I learned this week. Prolect proleptically. Proleptically. How many of you know what proleptically means? Pastor Forsberg introduced us to a new word in Sunday school. I'm bringing us to one today. This is a blessing. Proleptically, the definition is the presumption of a future act. In other words... He told them to do something on the assumption of something like it had already happened. It hadn't yet, but to act like it had already happened. Oh, listen to this. This is so good. Because when we have faith, we live in the presence of a promise not yet realized. I'm talking to people today who are possessors of the promise. If you've come to Christ as your personal Savior in Ephesians 2, 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit in, together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, imagine the awesome wonder of this. God has seated us on his glorious throne. In Christ, 
we are positionally already seated where he is. Uh, God has wrapped us up in Christ so that every time he looks at wicked, sinful us, he sees only Christ. We're like the Acadia wood in the old temple, the Old Testament, that twisted, gnarled wood that they used to build the temple, and then they covered it up with gold so that when anybody who looked at that wood, all they saw was the gold. And we are so wrapped in Christ that he does not see perfect, uh, imperfect, sinful us. He sees his son, Jesus Christ. And I know that one day I will physically realize the promise that is made there. And so now I want to live my life not ruled by my present limitations. I'll live according to the promise he has made about who I am. This is a blessing. I'm talking about living proleptically. Uh, I will live, and he asks you to live proleptively. Jesus said, I'm an overcomer, so live like it. Amen. Jesus said that there's no temptation that can overpower you, so live like that. Even though it seems like it does, and even so, though we seem overpowered, we can live proleptically because we have a promise and we know that he will stand by his promise. Greater is he that is in you, he says. So live like it, friend. Live like it. Possess the promise. The Bible says we can have joy no matter the circumstances. So let's live like it. I'm talking about living proleptically. So Jesus said that. All right. Go on. Go. Show yourself to the priests. What a ridiculous command. They look back. I wonder if there was some doubt. Do you think there was some doubt? I think there was, because they're humans. We would all have doubt in a situation like this. By the way, do you know what would happen if they all marched in there in front of the priest? They could get stoned for it, because they are, they're not allowed to go to the priest or in public. or You can't go to church like that. You're outside society, and they, you were allowed to throw rocks at them and kill them if you need to be to keep them away from you. Now Jesus says, march on into church there and see the priest can't do that. Jesus was going to cure them, but he was testing their faith. A faith that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. The last part of verse 14, read it here. As they went, they were cleansed. They were cleansed not before, not after. That means that when they left to go to the priest, they still had leprosy. And so, uh, they, and by the way, again, how do you suppose they felt about that? The last thing that a priest would want to see was these smelly, deformed, miserable lepers. I'm sure there was doubt. But off they go, doubting, notwithstanding, these shabby band of sufferings marching off to see the priests. You'll see the going represented the believing. And so they take a step. <laughs> I've tried to picture this in my mind. They take a step. Step one, nothing's changed. I still smell. I'm still warm. I still don't have these fingers. Step two, leprosy's still here. Nothing has changed yet. I, I, I haven't seen anything improve. Step three, maybe it's still there. But soon in step four, step five, or step six, they started to realize that I've got some strength back in my legs. I'm not hobbling anymore. I'm not curled over anymore, and then they would look at their arms and their pale, deformed uh, 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 skin that had been decomposing is now pink and healthy again, and soon as they keep going, they realize that now I'm not my raspy voice, I can all of a sudden speak again, and all these things started to happen in their body. I think it was pretty instantaneous, and they were healed, and now, now they run. Because the first one to the priest is the first one home. That's how lines work. Amen? That's what we'll see in a little bit in the food line. Amen? First one in line is the first one who gets to eat. The last one in line, a.k.a. pastor, uh, gets the scraps. Amen? So we know how that works. And they're off because they're going to get first in line and first to get to go home. Nine of them kept running. But that's not the end of the story. In fact... All of that was introduction. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Smelling good food and you find you're still in the introduction. Don't worry, that was the longest part. Look at verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and said with a loud voice, 
or, or, and with a loud voice glorified God, and he fell down at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Notice something interesting here. If nine of them were by inference Jews, they had to go to Jerusalem to see the priest. But this Samaritan would have to go to Mark Ger Mount Gerizim, which was further away. So they're going to get to their destination before he will. He has to go further, and he still made time to come back. He, came, he, he, he told himself, yes, I know I need to go to church. I know I need to go see the man of God, but there is something I simply have to do first. I have got to come to Jesus, and that's exactly what he did. He went to the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke says he fell on his face before the Lord and with a loud voice glorified God. He shouted for glory the same way that he shouted for mercy. There's a whole message there, but we want to move on, so I'm not going to do it now. He recognized not only the gift, but the giver of the gift. He's overcome with gratefulness. And why not? He's been healed of leprosy. For years, uh, he's been separated from his family, forgotten by his friends. He's been cut off from his own people, and suddenly all of that vanishes. He is whole again, and he's clean again. He's completely normal. He can go back to his family. No wonder he shouted. I would too. And then Luke adds the words, he was a Samaritan. Remember, the Jews thought the Samaritans were the scum of the earth, wanted nothing to do with them. <clears throat> to make matters worse, he's not only a Samaritan, he's a leper, which makes him even the most repulsive combination of all, a Samaritan leper. It's almost, really, if you wanted to do it in the vein that I think it was meant here, uh, we could read it this way. Think of it! He was a Samaritan. It was shocking for them. He was from the wrong race, the wrong religion. He had the worst possible disease, but he knew Jesus healed him. And he knew enough to be thankful. By inference, again, the other nine were Jews. They were the ones that should have been grateful, but they weren't. The one who shouldn't have come back did. By the way, this doesn't mean they didn't have faith. They demonstrated their faith. This doesn't mean they didn't have obedience. They showed us that. Their sin was not unfaithfulness or disobedience. Their sin was ungratefulness. And can I tell you today, the Lord Jesus Christ recognizes people who are ungrateful. He did then and he still did today. Or does today, I'm sorry. They, they got their miracle, but they missed salvation. And it means nothing, friend, if you get your miracle, but you don't get the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I, now, I know people have, have used that with me even today. They'll say, I know the Lord and I know the Lord is pleased with me because of my great success or the, the way that my business has been successful. No, 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 not, not so, my friend. The Lord says he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. And just because we have been blessing, blessed materially speaking does not mean God is pleased with us. We judge that by this book, not by our circumstances. Without Christ, your success is meaningless. Now, Jesus asks two questions, and he makes an admiring statement. Look at verses 17 through 19. Were not ten healed? That's question number one. Yes. Where are the other nine? Well, they're gone. They're Splitsville. They're running as fast as they can to the priest. They get home. And then he mentions only this one, this foreigner, has come back. Jesus seems genuinely perplexed. And can I remind you again, Jesus notices the ungrateful. And he appreciates the grateful. Why didn't they come back? We, we can imagine they're in a hurry to see the priest. They, they maybe assume Jesus knows how thankful we are. You look at these ten lepers, and they all appear to be alike. They all had leprosy. All were outcasts from society. All were determined to do something about it. All had heard that Jesus uh, or about Jesus and believed he could heal them. All were healed. On the outside, they appeared identical. Yet what a difference. Because nine went on. And one returned. One was grateful. Nine were not. One man found forgiveness. Nine did not. One man got two miracles. Nine men got one miracle. Uh, all ten were healed. That's one miracle. But the Samaritan was healed and forgiven. That's two miracles. And that's what Jesus means when he says, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Can I tell you, that last Samaritan, that one that came back, his miracle is still benefiting him today this very hour, the other nine have already died. We don't know what has happened to them. But they, uh, they, where are the nine? The answer is they got their miracle. They're running home as fast as they can. Almost if they say, okay, Lord, 
We got it from here. Thank you very much. Well, they didn't even say thank you very much. They just split. We have so little sense of how much God has done for us. You see, although leprosy is not in our immediate culture today, we do have a problem. We are born with the spiritual defilement of sin. Sin is ugly, it is vile, it is incurable, and it is polluting. It separates men from God, just like leprosy separated the leper from society. If you read Leviticus 13 and apply it to sin, it really is a great picture of sin, leprosy is, because sin is in deep, deeper than the skin. It is inside of us. Sin also spreads. Sin defiles and isolates. And just like the leprous garments are burned, uh, so those who die clothed in their sins without Christ will burn as well. The Bible is clear about that. But hallelujah, then came Jesus. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet leprous, while we were yet separated, while we were yet defiled, he gave his life for us. The Bible says Christ died for us. You see, you too are far from God, separated because of your sin. We're all born with this incurable disease, but when we cry out to the Savior, praise God, his mercy endureth forever, and he will hear that cry. Hallelujah! What a blessing that is. Now tell me, friend, we don't have something to be thankful for today. We ought to be a thankful people. Don't, don't get so busy in your life running towards your next appointment. You don't have time to stop and run back and throw yourself at the feet of your Savior and just say, thank you. Thank you. God reached down and touches us. Sets us free from the disease of sin, Romans chapter 6. He has broken sin's curse. He has conquered death's captivity. He split the veil that separated us from the presence of God. We can now boldly come into the throne of grace. Romans chapter 8 verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He is our Father. He is our protector. He is our provider. He is that friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And my question for you today, friend, is have you stopped lately and said thank you? Thank you. If you don't have a gratitude attitude, you just have an attitude. And so many of us do as we go throughout our Christian life. How ungrateful we can be for his great blessings. What, what we do is we, try, we often focus on our troubles instead of our blessings. I've used it many times before, so it's probably old, but it's the, what I call the stubbed toe principle. You know what your, your, your uh, little toe is for? You know what that's for, by the way? You ever wonder? Because it kind of sticks to a side and it doesn't really do anything. I know toes are for balance, but your, your pinky toe doesn't really do anything. I'll tell you what it's for. It's for finding stuff in the dark. That's what your pinky toe is for. You ever done that before? Uh, been walking around in the middle of the night or trying to fumble for a light and then your pinky toe finds something for you and then you do dance. You didn't know you could dance until you stub your pinky toe. But you know what we do when we do that? We stub our pinky toe. We don't, we don't sit there. Mm, oh, thank God for those nine toes that aren't stubbed. No. We dance and hold and we're trying to, all we are focused on is that little stub pinky toe. I'm asking you today, this is what thankfulness does. It takes the eyes off of the pinky toe and puts it on all the other blessings we have in our life. Because as humans, that's just how we're wired. We focus on the negative instead of focusing on the positive. When's the last time you said thank you? Think, stop the busyness, turn the TV off, turn, put the phone down, and just tell the Lord, thank you. When I realize the goodness of God, and I'm not talking about in general, I'm talking personally, particularly to me, what God has done for me. He's given me a great wife, loves the Lord, and loves me. Last night we had, I saw it, there was a bag of bagels on the kitchen counter, and uh, I said, hey, I'd like to take one of them to church with me and have it with my coffee in the morning. She said, sure, take it. And, uh, well, I didn't take it because I forgot because that's one of my superpowers. I forget things and do it on a regular basis. So uh, I, I got here, and, and I, I usually get here around, uh, around 6, 15, 6.30 on Sunday mornings and, and kind of prepare for the day. And, 
And uh, so around 7 o'clock, she got out of bed and brought me that bagel. Isn't that a blessing? Uh, what a, I, I'm grateful for the wife God's given me. I'm grateful for kids that are good 62.8% of the time. I have done the math. I'm grateful for a ministry that I can serve God in. I'm grateful for each and every one of you. All my physical needs are supplied. I don't need to be coerced to be thankful. I don't need to be pressured. And friend, neither do you when you stop and consider it. When we finally, when finally we look and see what God has really done for us, we take a moment to consider, we stop running our direction. Just stop and consider what God has done. We can't help but get on our knees and say, thank you, thank you. Ingratitude destroys our happiness. It cripples our joy. It withers our compassion. It paralyzes our praise. It run, renders us numb to all the blessings of God. Ten men were healed. One man gave glory to God. As you're living your life, are you living it with the nine or are you living it with the one? Which one are you uh, today in your life? You could say, well, hey, if I'd have been there. No, no, you are there, friend, every single day. You have an opportunity to be the one or to be the nine. Uh, far too many of us take our blessings for granted and we groan about our duties. Doesn't have to be that way. Pride is a choice. Gratefulness, it's a choice. What choice are you going to make today? A thankful heart or a, an ungrateful heart. No one is forced into bitterness. You live that way. No one is forced into praise. You're going to live that way. You're going to make a choice one way or the other. Uh, the one who returned to give thanks chose not to forget what Jesus had done for him. The secret of a thankful heart is a conscious choice not to forget what God's done for you. Being thankful. The question I have for you today is when's the last time you stopped what you're doing, stopped running towards your next whatever, and you just looked up and said, thank you. Thank you. You have that opportunity today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'd like to ask you today, friend, has God spoken to your heart about this specifically? Oh, friends, let's not live our lives as ungrateful people. Let's be grateful. Let's live the life of the one, not the nine. Would you stand up with me at this time? Heads bowed, eyes closed. We're not going to embarrass anybody, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond and come to an old-fashioned altar and just tell God, thank you, thank you. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, come up here and let somebody show you and take a Bible and show you how you can know that you know you go to heaven today if something happened to you. While she begins to play, if God spoke into your heart, would you respond? Maybe it's just as simple as coming up and saying, thank you. We've all got